cannabis is a plant that is um, usually annual, so individuals live uh, about a year. However, in tropical and subtropical climates, they live more than a year. It is wind pollinated. It is dioecious, so males and females are in different plants. However, there's monoecious populations, so hermaphrodites, that exist in natural populations. Um, cannabis is part of the family Cannabiacea. Um, this family has about 100 different species and about 10 different genera. And one of these other genus is Humulus, or hops, which is actually the closest living uh, species to, to cannabis. Um, and there is a lot of variation. I don't know if the slides, if you can see. Well, that one you cannot see that well. But there's a lot of phenotypic variation um, in the leaves. For example, these, these are different. These are leaves from different plants, and they vary in the number of leaflets, in the size of the leaflets, in the color of the plants. And there's a lot of phenotypic variation, not only in the leaves, but also in the plants, in the shape of the plants, the size of the plants, and particularly the compounds that the plant produces, right? The cannabinoids, which are the ones that interact with, with our endocannabinoid system, and the terpenoids, which are responsible for the smell. And because of all of this variation, cannabis has been used in, for, for multiple things, fiber, oil, biofuel, um, medicine. And in fact, it has been used by many ancient cultures, including the Chinese, the Egyptians, the Indians, the Greek, and the Romans have used it for, for multiple things. And um, we want to understand through genomic sequencing, the genome, so the genome is a whole collection of DNA, right? The DNA from, from one individual, so the DNA, the whole genome, how is that related to all of these different characteristics of the plant, so the different things that the plant produces? And through whole genome sequencing, so through sequencing the whole genome of many different plants, we now understand that there are different groupings in cannabis. Um, this is a split tree graph. Um, this is a, a tree. It shows the relationship between, in, in this case, these are 195 different varieties, so 195 different strains. So in this graph, the closer you are to each other, the more related you are to each other. So this thread-like structure that we see here in the middle, like this spider web, are the genomic regions that are shared between everyone. So these are the ancestral genomic regions. But we can see with this graph that there are three different groupings. So one of the groupings is this broadleaf marijuana type. The other one is this narrow leaf marijuana type. And the other one is this hemp grouping. And um, these two, the, the broad leaves and the narrow leaves, are, are used in medical and recreational settings. And then we have the hemps, which are more industrial. OK? So um, we want to understand more about how the genome is related to the physical characteristics, so the genotype and the phenotype. How are they paralleled? And particularly for these compounds that have medicinal um, value. Most of these plants over here have broad leaves, right? However, we don't yet know whether you can take and say, well, all of the people that are blonde are more closely related and all of the ones that are brunette are closely related. That might not work, right? You might take all of those genes and shuffle them around and it turns that, that, that I don't know, that your, your daughter might be very blonde and you're very brunette, right? So, so that's, that might be something that's going on. But so far, these are what our results suggest. Thank you. And this paper, this paper is, uh, is, is um, the preprint is publicly available. I think that the paper is also publicly, publicly available. It was part of, um, of a special issue on cannabis. And if you want, I can send you all of the links. We have two, two papers in that special issue. Uh, and we talk about that. Thank you. 
So where was I? Okay, so yeah, so now we know a more about the endocannabinoid system. Um, and we know that the endocannabinoid system is um, related to many biological functions. I have listed some of them here, but of course you might know about more functions that the endocannabinoid system has. And we know that the cannabinoids interact with our endocannabinoid system. And we know that cannabis is um, a very self-medicated um, drug of choice for many of these illnesses, and many of you will know many more illnesses that people use cannabis for. So we would like to know um, more about the cannabinoids because the problem with cannabis is that it's not just one compound. It's a mixture of compounds. So it's really hard to bring all of this mixture of compounds into a medical setting, right? Um, and and these, are, these, these are just some of the compounds that the plant produces. So uh, it's really hard chemically and medically to bring them all together. However, for a biologist or for a botanist, this gives rise to very interesting questions, right? So uh, what we wanted to know was where in the genome are the genes related to the production of cannabidiolic acid, which is CBDA, and uh, delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinolic acid, which is THCA. And we know that these two um, synthases, so the, a synthase is a protein that does something, right? A, a protein that performs a job. So we know that there are these two synthases that are part of this big pathway, so THCA synthase and CBDA synthase, which are here in number three, so it's kind of like a three-step biochemical pathway. And the precursor molecule is CBGA, so cannabigerolic acid, which is another molecule that has medical importance. And if the plant has THCA synthase, so it takes CBGA and turns it into THCA. If the plant has CBDA synthase, it takes CBGA and turns it into CBDA. If the plant has CBCA synthase, it takes CBGA and turns it into CBCA. Now, when we take that plant and we heat it up, either by baking or vaping or smoking, we turn those THCA into THC, CBDA into CBD, CBCA into CBC, right? So all of this part of the pathway from here, this, all of this part of the pathway happens in the plant. Now, this part does not happen in the plant. That part happens once we heat it up. And once we heat it up, when we have THC or CBD, that's what interacts with our endocannabinoid system, okay? So throughout the talk, I'm gonna be using these terms. Um, and you can ask me if, if you forget, like, what was that again? Because I, I use this every day, so I forget. But SNP, oh, no, that was not it. Okay. SNP is a single nucleotide polymorphism, and that's the change of one letter in the DNA. So it's one letter that changes, one nucleotide that changes. Sequencing is to determine each of the letters of the genome or part of the genome. Reads are the pieces that we produced by sequencing. So when you sequence a genome, you produce pieces, chunks of DNA, and those are called reads. Assembly is when you put all of those pieces together, like a puzzle. Uh, alignment is when you arrange sequences, so the sequence of one gene and we put it together, we, we compare it to another sequence, uh, just to identify regions of similarities or differences. Where do these two sequences differ? So we align them. And depth are the number of reads in a given nucleotide. Okay, so how many reads have that one letter? And you can count them, right? Well, you're not gonna see them, but you do it by informatically, which is most of what I do is sit down in a computer and punch out commands, and then the computer gives me results. A genome assembly, so you have a reference, and you take the reads, and you put them together like a puzzle. 
currently we have two genome assemblies. One of them is published, uh oh, I keep pressing the wrong button, sorry. So one of them is published, uh, it was published in 2011, so it's publicly available. Anyone can download it. The other one is not published yet, but it's gonna be published with this paper that I'm writing, so I'm writing all of this convoluted story. Um, and both <coughs> assemblies uh, were the sequences from marijuana type plants, so they were high THC. One of them is a pineapple baba kush, the other one is a purple kush. Um, they were sequenced by different technologies. I'm not gonna go into depth about the different sequencing technologies, but if you're curious, we can talk about it afterwards. But one of them was sequenced via PacBio, and PacBio is this newer technology that gives us very long reads. The problem is that it's one, very expensive, and two, it comes with a lot of errors. So sometimes it's really hard to tell whether that was indeed a SNP, that was indeed a change in one letter, or whether that was a mistake. Uh, the other one is an Illumina 454 assembly, mostly Illumina, so those are two different technologies. And Illumina uh, is less expensive, uh, it comes with fewer errors, but the reads are much shorter. So in other words, by putting together these assemblies, it's like building a 5,000 piece puzzle that comes with fewer errors versus doing a toddler's puzzle that are, have these huge pieces but comes with more mistakes. So we had these two assemblies available, right? And we wanted to know where in those assemblies, where in those two puzzles are the genes related to the production of THC and CBD. So THCA synthase and CBDA synthase, right? So the proteins that produce THCA or CBDA. Originally, and this is back to, to ninth grade biology, we thought that these two synthases were um, Mendelianly inherited, so they were the product of, they were two alleles from the same gene, so, so two different forms of the same gene. And if that was heterozygous, so it produced both CBD and THC, both CBD and THC, and mom was also heterozygous and also produced a CBD and THC, then the offspring, uh, one quarter would produce CBDA, the other quarter would produce THCA, and then one half would be heterozygous like their parents, right? So, so one quarter would be homozygous, the other quarter would be homozygous, and then one half would be heterozygous like their parents. So that was what we originally thought. So here, uh, we have the reference, right? So this is the reference, and these are all of the reads that we aligned to this reference. And what we did is that we took, we had the, the THC, the, the PAC bio, the pineapple baba kush assembly. We took the reads from the, that pineapple baba kush and we aligned it to itself and did the same thing with the purple kush assembly with the one that was sequenced via Illumina, so the two different assemblies. And what we found is that there were many reads that were very different from each other. So here in this screen, we have here, it's the reference, and all of these are the reads that align to this reference. And all of these letters over here are SNPs, so are changes in one letter in the genome. So we, we were looking at reads that were very different from each other. So we thought, okay, maybe we found paralogs. And paralogs are these genes that are related to each other by duplication. So they duplicate themselves within the genome, right? So we said, so okay, we have many different genes, so this is just not one gene. These are many, many different genes. And around that same time, there was this paper that was published, and this paper um, shows that there's sequence heterogeneity, 
So there's differences in the sequences that are related to uh, the production of THCA synthase and CBDA synthase. So then, because at, at the beginning, if, if when we saw that, it's like, oh, these look like different genes, but maybe I did it wrong. But then when we had this paper, it's like, okay, no, this is probably right. So maybe there's a lot of different genes that are related to the production of these compounds. So we went ahead and we looked in both assemblies whether indeed we found many different genes. And we found them. So this is a tree like I showed you in the beginning. Um, this is a maximum likelihood tree, which is a way, a maximum likelihood is a way that you, um, you relate things to each other. This is a genealogy because we're relating genes. So um, in this case, the genes that belong to the purple Kush assembly that was sequenced via Illumina are, start with the word scaffold. The genes that belong to the PAC bio assembly start with a zero. And uh, the closer you are in this, in this tree, the more related you are to each other. So each of these is a gene. That's why this is a genealogy. We found those genes. Uh, again, in this, in this tree, we're looking at the relationship between those genes. Uh, we found 16 paralogs in, overall. Uh, of the 16 paralogs, 11 were from the pineapple baba kush, and five were from the purple kush. So we found 11 genes that are related to the production of CBDA and THCA in the pineapple baba kush, and five of these genes in the purple kush assembly. Okay? Um, and this, all of this tree, is what I'm calling the CBDA THCA synthase gene family. So all of these 16 genes are a gene family. Now, um, we found that there's five of them that are directly responsible for the production of CBDA and THCA. So these five over here, I highlighted them. Of these five, we have three that are related to the production of CBDA, two from the uh, pineapple baba kush assembly, one from the purple kush assembly, and we have two that are directly responsible for the production of THCA, one from each assembly. So I, I wanna know that if everyone is there, right? Like we found many genes that are responsible for the production of these compounds. So it was not a Mendelianly inherited trait, right? There's many genes that are related to the production. So again, there's five of them that are directly responsible for the production of THCA and CBDA. We don't know all of the rest, what's going on, they're there. Now, the stop signs and the go signs in this, in this tree, the stop signs are genes that are truncated. So they're prob they, they do not produce a protein. The go signs are genes that are not truncated, so likely they can be translated into a protein. So uh, now we had further questions. So we wanted to know whether different cannabis varieties differ in the copy number of these genes, right? So if you take a Blue Dream versus, I don't know, uh, Girl Scout cookies. Are they gonna differ in the number of these genes? So we needed to figure out copy number variation. So is there copy number variation? So how do we find copy number variation in, this, in these plants? So we had 67 genomes from 67 different varieties um, available. Uh, and so we align them to the reference, again, what I showed you at the beginning. This is the reference. This is what we do when we do an alignment. Here is when you check that the alignment is right, you just check your screen, oh yeah, it's, it's going well. So this is what you see on your screen. So we align the 67 different genomes. The 67 different genomes belong to these three groupings that I showed you at the beginning. 
we had 31 from the narrow leaves, 15 from the broad leaves, and 16 hemp's. So we have some that, that did not belong to any of those groupings, but uh, overall we had 67 different genomes from these three different groups. And so we aligned them, and then we looked at the depth. So the depth is how many reads align to one particular base pair. So to this particular base pair over here, then you go on and count the reads, right? How many reads align to that one base pair? And you do that for the whole genome. So for 67 different genomes, that took the computer about two weeks, right? Because I was aligning them to two different references, right? And we're talking about an 830 million base pair genome, which is not that big. Um, so, so, yeah, so then once we have the depth, that gives us an estimate of the number of genes. And so uh, for the genes, the three ones that are related to um, the production of CBD, we found differences within groups. So this is a box and whiskers plot. In, we have three different panels because we have three different genes, right? Two from one assembly, the, the, the PacBio assembly, and the other one from the Illumina assembly. In the y-axis, we have estimated copy number. In the x-axis, we have the three different groups. And what we can see is that, okay, so the box holds 50% of the data, right? This shows us kind of like the, um, how the data is distributed, right? So the box holds 50% of the data. The box plus the lines above and below the boxes are 100% of the data. Now the line in the middle of the boxes is the median. And what we see is that there are differences between these groupings, right? So the different varieties hold different number of genes. And then for the two that are responsible for the production of THC, we found the same thing. The different groupings differ in the number of genes. So to conclude this part, we found copy number variation in these genes related to the production of THC and CBD. Uh, therefore, the cannabinoid content, the amount of CBD or the amount of THC that a plant produces might be a product of not only the sequence, so not only the letters that you have there, but also the number of these genes that you have. So copy number variation is a very fast way of acquiring variation. And we know that there's copy number variation in genes that are related to stress and to disease. In potatoes, for example, we found that genes that are related to disease vary in their number because it's a very fast way to acquire genetic diversity. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about a little bit about the paper that got published. Um, as you know, if scientists that wanna study cannabis have to use the plants that are grown uh, for NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, which is part of the NIH. Um, and these plants are grown at the University of Mississippi. And um, there are companies, private companies, that, that test for the chemotypes, so for the cannabinoids and the terpenoids, from the private markets. One of them is Steep Hill. So this is just a result from Steep Hill. This is for this strain Girl Scout cookies. We have the different cannabinoids here and the different terpenoids. This is just a result that I took from their website. So we have an ongoing collaboration with Steep Hill and they provided us with their data. So with their data, we were able to compare the cannabinoids from the private market to those from NIDA, so those that are grown in the University of Mississippi, we were able to compare these two, uh, these two groups. We had four locations for the private markets. So we have Seattle, uh, Oakland, Sacramento, Denver, and the ones grown for NIDA here in the University of Mississippi. And uh, what we found 
is that NIDA has the lowest percent THC and the lowest percent CBD. So here in the y-axis we have percent cannabinoid. This first group of, of, um, of bars are CBD. The second are THC. NIDA is the second bar in white. NIDA has the lowest percent CBD, the lowest percent THC. And when we do the one-on-one -on -one comparison, so Seattle to Denver, Seattle to Oakland, Seattle, NIDA differs from everyone in the percent um, THC and from almost everyone in the percent THC. Uh, we wanted to know about the range. So again, how is the data distributed? So this is another box on whiskers plot. Um, in this panel, we have percent CBD in the y-axis. In this other panel in the y-axis, we have percent THC. We have location in the x-axis. NIDA is the second box. So again, the box has 50% of the data. The box plus the lines above and below the boxes hold 100% of the data. And what we can see is that NIDA's boxes is the smallest one. So in other words, it has the smallest range of both CBD and THC. Then we did a principal components analysis, which is an analysis that allows us to understand the whole variation in cannabinoids. And so this is the whole variation. Uh, the private market captures all of this variation. Then we were able to partition this with another, um, another test that is called a K-means clustering test. We were able to partition this variation into two groups. So this pink one and this gray one. And uh, the NIDA varieties are only found in the pink group, right? And if we partition this same graph by location, we can see that Oakland in, in blue and Sacramento in purple capture all of the variation. However, NIDA only captures a fraction of the variation. So, so Oakland and Sacramento capture NIDA's variation but NIDA does not capture Oakland's and Sacramento's variation. So to conclude this part, NIDA's varieties lack variation. They lack potency. Research with NIDA's varieties is not accurate. I don't know you, but I don't know anyone that uses NIDA's varieties either for medication or for recreational. So research with NIDA's varieties is not representative of what people are using. So now we have further questions, right? At the beginning, I showed you that there's many genes that are responsible for the production of THC and CBD, that there is a copy number variation. And now my question is, could the NIDA varieties be underrepresenting this genomic variation in, in these strains? We need to sequence those NIDA varieties and count the number of genes. Before we do that, this suggests it's suggestive, but we still don't know whether there is a perfect correlation between the number of genes that you produce and the amount of cannabinoids that you produce. There might not be a correlation. We just know, okay, you have this many genes. However, would you produce a lot of THC or a lot of CBD? We don't know. At a CU Boulder, we applied, so the University of Mississippi are the ones that grow the weed for NIDA. We applied to be the ones to grow the weed, and there was something like ridiculous, like all oh, the application is due on Friday, and instead it was due on Thursday, and we didn't get it. It was something super ridiculous, but we didn't get it. But uh, but we've not been able to to get a permit at CU Boulder to grow weed. To have there's been five labs: a chemistry lab, a, a neuroscience, a biology that we've applied for a license and we've not been able to get a license to, to have marijuana on campus.